Good afternoon, everybody. This is Alan Jay, Acting National Director of Outreach and Engagement at the Zionist Organization of America. I'd like to welcome you all and let you know that we at Zoom hope and pray, at ZOA hope and pray that all on this call are and remain safe and healthy. Uh, this is the latest installment of ZOA's rapidly developing virtual programming. To date, we've done a programming, we've done programs featuring ZOA National President Mort Klein. We've hosted Ambassadors Dan Danone and Ron Dermer, our ZOA campus professionals, offered deep insight into ZOA campus activities. We've offered educational programs and there's much, much more to come. Please pay close attention to our ZOA emails, visit our website and Facebook, and please visit our YouTube channel often as we're beginning to post programs, recordings of our programs. The Zionist Organization of America was founded in 1897 and has been at the forefront of pro-Israel and pro-Jewish advocacy for more than 120 years. Through our Center for Law and Justice, Department of Government Relations, and ZOA campus, in the halls of Congress, in the media, and in your neighborhood, ZOA shares truth and facts that support Israel's right to be and remain a sovereign Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria, with Jerusalem as her undivided capital, and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. Today is a somber day indeed, but I believe our speaker, Sammy Steigman, uh, will demonstrate that there is also hope reflected in this very important mm -hmm. day. I think I can capture ZOA's uh, perspective on Yom HaShoah by reading a bit of an excerpt from a news release that we sent out for Yom HaShoah in 2017. Uh, the ZOA commemorates Holocaust Remembrance Day to never forget the six million precious Jewish souls that were lost due to unbridled hatred of the Jewish people by the German Nazis and others. A callous and uncaring world whose own indifference and even enmity toward Jews allowed this to happen. Millions of Beautiful Jewish people could have been saved if actions were taken. They were not. Not by America, not by England, not by anyone. We at ZOA are powerfully inspired by the strength, courage, and remarkable resilience of the Jewish people to rise from the ashes of the Holocaust to become extraordinarily productive contributors to the world in virtually every field, all of which is capped by the miraculous rebirth of the Jewish state of Israel. And ZOA will continue to do all we can to fight the increasing scourge of Jew hatred and the ongoing Arab Islamic war against Israel. We will also speak out against prejudice and irrational hatred and violence against any people in all corners of the world. We pray that God will bless us to help us achieve a safer and more loving and tolerant world. Sammy Steigman was a victim of the Holocaust. When he was liberated, Sammy became a survivor. Now he is a motivational speaker. Sammy was born in 1939 in Cernovitz Bukovina in Romania, part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Sammy spent his infancy from 1941 through 1944 in a Ukrainian labor camp. Upon liberation, Sammy's family emigrated to Israel. As a young adult, Sammy served in the Israeli Air Force. In 1968, Sammy came to live in the United States. Sammy has dedicated his life to reaching as many young people as possible, and in fact, often works with our ZOA campus department. We are very pleased to have Sammy come and speak to us. Sammy, the program is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, extremely happy uh, and very honored, okay, to be able to speak today on behalf of the ZOA. I am part of the ZOA campus. I speak in different campuses. I can see here one of the coordinators, Ben Schein, okay? Oh. And uh, uh, interestingly now, before I'm going to talk about myself, I want to uh, make a comparison between Passover, which you just celebrated, and also with the Yom HaShoah. Uh, I also want to make a comparison between uh, Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron. And I also want to make uh, clear, because I found out about six months ago, that the young people are in most cases clueless about 
the events, okay, about the Holocaust. So I will give a short background. Some of it you may know, some of it you may find out very interesting. So during Passover, what happened is, is we are mandated every single year to talk about it, to read the Haggadah, and to feel that we personally were liberated from Israel. I think that the Holocaust should be in the same with them. Because if we, the next generations, if they will not talk and keep talk, telling the story, it's very easily, people have a tendency to forget and within five, 50 years, the Holocaust will be a history footnote. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I don't know how many of you know Hebrew, but uh, when we say Yitzias Mitzrayim, okay, that we were liberated from Egypt, the root in Hebrew for Mitzrayim is Meitzah, which is basically constriction. So it's not only when we talk about Passover, it's not only physical liberation from the land of Egypt, but at the same time also liberation, spiritual liberation from our restriction that we put on ourselves. Now next week we are going to celebrate, uh, not to celebrate, to remember uh, uh, Yom Mazikaron. And there is a connection between the Holocaust and this law. And I want you to remember the importance also of the state of Israel. During the Holocaust, people died because we did not have a country. And Yom Azikaron, we will remember the people that died for us to have a country. Okay. Uh, and also in Jewish life, we celebrate life. So here is the interesting, I believe we are the only country that does it. Right after Yom Azikaron, okay, we celebrate our Independence Day, celebration and everything else. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the background of the Holocaust. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you know about it, uh, but please bear with me. Uh, as you probably know, the Germans, when they came to power, did not want to kill the Jews. That was not their goal. They wanted to have a Germany free of Jewish people, Juden Frei. Hitler met with approximately 32 uh, world leaders, and he said, I don't want the Jews in my, people, in my country. If you want them, take them. Nobody wanted them, except three countries officially accepted Jewish refugees. That was China. My uncle, from 42 people from my father's side, is the only one that survived. He was not a survivor, he was a refugee in Shanghai. The other country was Dominican Republic and Philippines. Okay. Uh, when the war started, which a lot of people do not make the difference, Europe was occupied. Poland, on the other hand, was never occupied. Poland was annexed and it became part of the greater Germany. So here it is in Germany, they did not want the Jews and they found in Poland 3.3 million Jews. What do you do with them? And I want you to understand that the Holocaust evolved. It's not something that happened suddenly. Okay. Uh, the other thing is people also, uh, when I ask when did the Holocaust start, uh, I get all kinds of answers. The truth of the matter is the unofficial Holocaust started on June 22nd, 1941. This is when the Wehrmacht attacked the former Soviet Union and behind them there were the special groups and their job was to murder the subhumans the Germans considered the Russians subhumans and to murder the Jews. As a matter of fact, the Einsatzgruppe murdered one and a half million Jews, including, you know, with the cooperation of their collaborators. How, uh, but uh, interestingly enough, that was unofficial. Officially, it was January 20, 1942, in a city which today is part of Berlin, 
fancy 15 high ranking Nazi criminals got together. And they decided the final solution to the Jewish question. Among them was one person who was not part of the policymakers, but he was the one that implemented it. And I use him as an example of the efficiency of the Nazis and their collaborators to be able in a short time to murder 11 million people. Adolf Eichmann. Towards the end of the war in 1944, in only two months, deported 437,000 Hungarian Jews to their deaths. There were two trials. There was the Nuremberg trial, there was not about the Holocaust, it was to bring the high ranking Nazi criminals to justice. But in 61, and uh, I was in Israel at that particular time because we came to Israel in 1961, okay, there was the Eichmann trial. And that was about the Holocaust. About 102 people, survivors, gave testimony. It was shown all over the world for three months, every single day, for three hours. This was the first time that the Holocaust survivors stopped feeling guilty, ashamed, and like victims, and they felt empowered and they started to talk. Let's talk a little bit about myself. I belong to two generations. Uh, we, because Chernobyl, like Alan said, was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and my nationality changed as the borders changed. So when we came to Israel, in my passport said I was born in Romania. I actually grew up there. Uh, when uh, we came to the United States, uh, I came by myself. In my passport said I was born in the former Soviet Union. And today it says I was born in Ukraine. So because it belonged to Romania, we were not deported by the Germans. We were deported by the Romanians. Uh, into a labor camp. If you will ask any survivor, how come you're alive? There is no rhyme and reason. Everybody will use only one single word. That's luck. My luck was that I was never separated from my parents. My luck was that I was too young. I was only a year and a half. In a labor camp, I couldn't work. So they did medical experiments on me and I still feel the side effects today. The other thing is, that after uh, the medical experiments, a lot of people in the camps died of attrition, disease, starvation. In came a stage that I was like of starvation, not far away from the camp. There was a farm owned by Germans. The woman brought food to the guards in the SS, and when she saw the physical signs that I'm dying of starvation, big head, swollen stomach, swollen feet, she risked not only her own life, but she risked the life of her entire family and decided to give me milk. Okay. People that saved strangers, risking the life of their entire family are called the righteous among the nations. Uh, six years ago, I was in Israel. I gave testimony at the Yad Hashem, and I went to the Garden of the Righteous Among the Nations. Obviously, I do not know the name of the person that saved my life, but I was very happy to see a marker honoring the unknown righteous among the nations. Uh, when I'm saying that I'm still suffering today, I was in extremely uh, powerful medication. Uh, I would say very close below morphine. Uh, about 20, between 20 and 25 years ago, I'm starting to lose track of time, uh, I decided I did not like the side effects and I decided to learn to live without the pain killers. So today I do not use pain killers, I did not get addicted because I use the medication not for recreation but for uh, pain. The problem that I had is the fact that uh, the pain is my head, neck, shoulders and back. But it's not stationary. It's moving from place to place. Okay, at the same time, the intensity is also, it can be, you know, seven, eight, and it can be two or three. 
Okay, so it's constantly moving. So there was no cure for whatever I went through. As a matter of fact, uh, I used to live in Milwaukee. I think uh, I know Sheila. Uh, and when I used to live in Milwaukee, there was a doctor, he was a very well-known neurosurgeon. And he decided uh, to uh, put me on traction. What he did for my back, my neck hurt. Did something for my neck, my back hurt. So I said, can you do something that releases the pain from both simultaneously, both sides? He said, no. I said, thank you for being my friend, I'm going home. So and I learned to do whatever I can do, okay, and live with uh, the pain. My first memory, Uh, of the war is not about the Holocaust. Uh, when I was approximately seven years old, <clears throat> I had a nightmare that lasted for a very, very, very long time. And I was on the corner of a building, pitch dark, and the only lights that I saw or the sounds that I heard were from the explosions. For whatever reason it is, in my nightmare, I was stark naked, and I felt that I'm in a void. Although I lived in a loving family, that feeling lasted for a very long time, and I was always associating myself with people older than me, teenagers or adults, because that made me feel protected. As a matter of fact, I don't remember ever associating myself with children my own age. Uh, we can go further into details because I want to give you the opportunity to ask me questions. But I am also a motivational speaker. So I'm a survivor not only of the Holocaust, but I'm also a survivor of the life challenges. And I'm going to tell you only about two of them. Later on, if you're interested, I will give you uh, how I was able to overcome. Number one, I was homeless. And whatever I'm going to tell you, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. But I want everybody, and this is when I go to the campuses and schools, for the young people to learn under no circumstances to give up or to lose hope. So in 1996, at age 56, I became homeless. I am not a street person. I tried to commit suicide. But before I did that, I decided to uh, open the window and to see my father for the last time. Once I saw my father, I said, I've never been a quitter in my life. I am going, okay, uh, to live. The other thing is, I have a son. I have two grandchildren. And I'm not allowed to see my grandchildren. How do you overcome something like this? So it's very briefly and later, if you want, I can go into details. Uh, I was able to overcome uh, when I became homeless by volunteering. And I empower and I ask every young person to start volunteering. I used to volunteer for every for 18 different organizations because each one gave me something that was missing in my life. And I want everybody to know that when you volunteer, okay, you're getting a lot more than what you put. Yeah. And the other one, uh, all of us have a need and a want. My personal want is to go to Australia. If it happens, wonderful. If it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world. But I have a need. And my need is to teach and to share, which I cannot do with my son, with my grandchildren. So I have to find a healthy substitute. So when I'm going to schools or to the campuses, and I tell them, my healthy substitute is the students. Even for the two hours that we are together, I tell them, you are my substitute grandchildren. And you should see how happy I am when I receive the letter from fourth graders, fifth graders, writing to me, I'm so happy that for two hours they could be your grandchild. So when we go through life, we have to find healthy substitutes. The past belongs in the past. Uh, I don't have to tell you, but you probably know a lot of people that uh, when they go to a trauma, they ask themselves, why me? 
And uh, by the way, since we are talking about the COA, I want to tell Sheila's father, he was very much in, okay, involved with the COA. I know that because I was part of it. Uh, so interestingly uh, enough, uh, but I want to tell you something, how I was all my life, I was a Zionist. Uh, I actually um, belong to a religious, I grew up Orthodox way, I belong to a, a religious Orthodox, a, a religious uh, Zionist organization, if you're familiar with Bnei Akiva. Interesting enough, in 1947, I was only six and a half years old, and some pioneers, okay, came through our small town where I lived. Uh, we lived in Transylvania after the war. And uh, interestingly enough, one of them came to me and he says, do you want to go to Palestine? I said, no. Are you a Zionist? No. He said, I'll circumcise you. I said, I'm going to Palestine. I'm going to Israel. So a little fear uh, does not uh, hurt. Uh, interestingly enough, my father applied to go to Israel in 1949. We received the visa only in 1961. So when we came to Israel, I served in the Israeli Air Force. And in 1968, I came by myself to the United States. And uh, interestingly enough, I wanted to, to meet the only other person that survived as a refugee in Shanghai, and that was my uncle, Max, who lived in Santa Barbara. Uh, I had a second cousin in Milwaukee. Uh, he was very wealthy, and he promised my father that he would take care of me because I came to the States without money and without the language. Obviously, promises made, not kept, so I struggled for a very long time. I did not want to go back to Israel feeling as a failure. Five years later, I decided I'm going back to Israel. I met my ex, we got married, I had my son, we got divorced, it was a very bitter divorce. I decided to go back to Israel in 1983, never thinking that I would ever come back to the States. But you all are familiar with a Jewish mother. And while I was in, the, in America, I denied my Americanization. Whatever I did was it good for Israel, was it good for the Jews. My mother, being a very sensitive woman, realized that I'm more American than Israeli. And she said, if you ever want to go back, you have my blessing. I said, mother, don't joke, because one day I'll just come and I'll say goodbye. I'm leaving today. She said, fine. And that's what happened in 1988. Uh, I did not want to go back to Milwaukee because my ex was there with my son. I did not want to disturb whatever life he had. So uh, New York was for me just a stopping point because I've been away for five years. But uh, I came at the height of the inflation. I had to take a job. I had to have a place to live. So one thing to uh, led to the other. And I am today, okay, uh, living okay in new york it's my last home i stopped being a wandering jew uh, as a motivational speaker when i go to schools my goal is to prepare them for the future but when i'm going to campuses i have a totally different goal and my goal is for to empower them to become active there is too much apathy okay, in the campuses. Uh, I'll just give you an example when I'm talking about apathy. I spoke to the president of a Jewish organization at NYU. Uh, I live in New York. And I asked him, do you have any problems there? And he said, no. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, there are so many of us that when they demonstrate, we just ignore them. And that's exactly the wrong point because they can indoctrinate people and you don't have the problem response for it, and this is where COA, ZON campus is uh, playing a very important role, and I'm very happy to be uh, part of it. Uh, there is a lot more that I can talk about it, but there is one thing that I have to mention, and that is the importance of words. Holocaust and genocide did not happen 
out of the blue. It evolved. And it all starts with the way we think. Okay? Positive thinking will lead to positive words, will lead to positive uh, attitude, positive experiences, and a happier life. But interestingly enough, okay, words mean a lot. And before I go any further, since I said that I'm a Zionist, I want to explain what Zionist means to me personally. It's the right of the Jewish people to have their own homeland, okay, and at the same time, to determine our own future. Okay. Uh, I do not believe in a one, a two-state solution. At not at this stage, you don't have to agree with me. Okay. I, I teach them about the tolerance, accept other people's opinion, other people's culture, but we do not have at this stage partners for peace. Hamas is not a partner for peace. PLO is not. They don't even recognize, okay, the right of Israel to exist. How do you make peace with somebody? So we don't have partners. So therefore, at this particular stage, we had the experience what happened in Gaza. If we have a two-state, uh, that will become something else. But I'm going to talk about the importance of wars, and I'm going to refer to the United States and to Israel. And I want you to understand something very important. I do not use names, but words have meanings. And people say that Holocaust is happening today in the world. And we have to stand up. That is a lie. There is a difference between genocide and Holocaust. Genocide, made out of two words, geno, group, side, murder, is the murder of a group of people. Holocaust, on the other hand, is the annihilation of a group of people. The Jews were the only group of people slated to be completely annihilated from the face of the earth. They were starting in Europe and they were going to open up a museum and they were going to call it the Museum of the Extinct Jewish Race. I want everybody to understand when somebody says that Holocaust is happening to stand up, there is no ethnic group today slated to be completely annihilated from the face of the world. Genocide is happening. The other thing is people are saying that we have concentration camps in the United States. That is a lie. There are no concentration camps here. If you want to compare them, you can compare them to the DP camps. The DP camps, okay, were run by the Allies after the war. There was no threat of being killed. I use the word concentration camp, but in context of a different group. And that is the Uyghur people. And if you don't know about them, let me tell you who they are. In the former Soviet Union, when the Jews did not want to be uh, deported to Siberia or face other dire consequences, they went to the south areas like Azerbaijan and Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan live Muslims, their language is close to the Turkish one, and they receive the Jews with open arms. I was asked to speak in uh, front of the UN building and at the national rally in Washington DC on their behalf. You may be surprised, but I had no idea who they were. Never heard of them. I had to do some research and I found out that 50 million of them live in China and they are deported. They are tortured. They are forced to give up their heritage, their tradition, their beliefs, and to accept the Chinese culture. As a matter of fact, if they would marry a Chinese person, automatically they would get a house in the car for free. The families do not know what happened to the people that were deported. They are afraid to talk to their families in China because they may be deported also. In that particular case, and there is always the threat of death, uh, the Chinese call it re-education camp. I live in a communist country and I can tell you it has nothing to do with education. But in that particular case, in the proper context, concentration camps okay, can be used and I use it. 
There is a lot more that I can talk. But what I would really prefer is to answer your questions. And please feel comfortable to ask questions on any subject that you want. I don't represent anybody. I represent myself. Okay, I will give you my personal opinion. And just if your opinion is different than mine, please, okay, let's have a conversation. Okay, I'm not afraid of it. But just as I will respect your opinion that is different than mine, all I'm asking is to respect my opinion that may be different than yours. And before we go to it, I just want to say one thing that is I really am very upset what's happening in this country. People have forgot how to disagree in a civil way. And I forgot to tell you something about this. I told you about the United States. People use the word, okay, West Bank. First of all, we have to understand one thing. Like the Greeks are coming from Greece. Jews are coming from Judea. Israel, the rebirth of Israel, is coming back to our own homeland. If we are coming back to our own homeland, you cannot occupy it. Okay, so therefore, even the Jewish leader, instead of using the word occupation in perpetuating a false narrative, they should use Judea and Samaria. And instead of saying occupied territories, they should use the word disputed territories. Disputed territories can lead to a dialogue. Occupied territories, that brings to a confrontation. So that's my personal opinion. And the Jewish people, especially the leaders, they have to take a stand. And they, since they are not doing it, this job falls upon the young people okay, to do it for us. I lived my life, I fought my wars, now it's the young people's world. Okay, I'm opening up for uh, questioning. It feels, okay, like I told you, yeah. very open, you can ask any questions on any subject. So Sammy, thank you for that wonderful presentation. There are two ways that you can ask questions. You can type a chat into the community chat, you can raise your hand, or you can even unmute your own mic but please be uh, respectful of other folks that may be asking questions. So the floor is now open. If you have a question, please uh, ask. I see Joseph Flashner. Give us a second. Sheila, you can hear me? Okay. I hope that you will contact me, okay? You have the information or I can ask uh, Ellen somebody. I would like to get in touch with you if, if that's okay with you. And I want to know about uh, your parents. I want to know about your siblings and everything else. Joseph Flashner, you can ask your question. Yes, my question is uh, when, you, when, you, when you speak on campuses and you see um, uh, you know, a total uh, disregard for you know, uh, freedom of speech, um, as you know, freedom of speech is, is one of the bases of the Constitution here in the United States. And only one kind of speech is allowed on campus today. There's an imbalance of political opinions. I, I want to know how do you deal with it and what's your opinion about it? I'll give you an, an example that actually happened. I can give you several examples, but I'm talking about I was in Bergen Community College in uh, New Jersey. And there was a Palestinian that asked me a question to which there was no good answer. The question was, why did the Israelis murder 300 Palestinians? There is no context. When? Where? What happened? Why? So I tried to redirect, okay, the discussion in different areas and to show them that there are the Israelis set aside, the Palestinians set aside, and let's have a dialogue, let's talk. Every time I try to redirect the question, okay, in the discussion, he always came back to the same question. So after a while, I said, look, let's agree that we disagree. But I felt that I succeeded because after the Q&A, a student came to me and said one thing. 
I did not know that. So here it is, there was a person with an open mind. We cannot change anybody else's, uh, uh, we cannot change anybody else. What we can do is to change somebody else's perspective. They have to make the change by themselves. So this is one of the things that I, when I go to campuses, uh, I welcome if somebody uh, confronts me because I want to have a discussion. Let me give an example of what the dialogue means because we use words and they mean different things to different people. All of you are probably familiar with uh, UC Berkeley. And in UC Berkeley, uh, I found out that there is a Christian uh, Lebanese student that had very strong negative feelings against this. And I was wondering if he would be willing to talk to me. And to my surprise, he said yes. When I asked him, why do you feel the way you do against the state of Israel? I made sure that even facially, I did not give him the opportunity to misinterpret that I am confrontational. I listened very carefully to what he said. But the way you treat a person, that's the way they will treat you. He gave me the same courtesy. And guess what? Approximately 45 minutes later, we shook hands. I said, you're taking two things and you're putting them together. If you're against the Israeli government's policy, you have my blessing. The Jews do it. Do it. Do it. But the state of Israel has done nothing to you. Can you separate them? And by having a dialogue, he said, yes. And that's what it is when we talk to somebody that has a different opinion, make sure that you do not give them the opportunity, okay? Not with words, just even facially, that you're confrontational. Listen carefully to what they have to say. And after that, okay, they will listen to you and maybe you can reach the beginning, maybe of a friendship, of a dialogue or something. And that's what's missing in this country. Everybody blames somebody else. Nobody takes responsibility. Uh, okay? In my particular case, I became homeless. It's very easy for me to be angry at the people that stole money from me. I am not. And do you know why? Because they took responsibility. These were people that I trusted with my life. I gave them cash. Prove it. I did not put anything in writing. Prove it. So, I took responsibility and I said, okay, it's not their fault. They took advantage of my stupidity. And by accepting my responsibility, I am today a free man. I don't need to blame them. I don't need to blame the circumstances and I don't need to blame myself. I made a mistake. Move forward. Yes. Sammy, I have a question from Robert Squara. Hello, Robert. Yes. Did your Shah experience affect your marriage? Uh, no. In my particular case, uh, my marriage was affected for a different reason. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but I'll just give you just the background. In the first year, when her mother liked me, I couldn't do anything wrong. She did not see me as Sammy. She saw me through the eyes of her mother. In the next year, when her mother did not like me, because uh, she had another daughter in Israel that married somebody from the Sephardic uh, people. And the Sephardim, they are extremely loyal to their parents. But he became very close to my ex-mother-in-law. And my mother was an uneducated woman, but she had a heart of gold. And she wanted me to love her more than my own mother. And I said, look, I call you mother. I love you. I respect you, everything else. But I'm not going to give up my mother. And because I did not do what the other son-in-law did, she did not like me. And after that, I couldn't do anything right. So it's uh, one of the reasons, but had nothing to do with the Holocaust, 
Uh, at the same time, I did not know how to deal with somebody that had low self-esteem. And uh, my ex, interestingly enough, she was independent before she met me. When we got married, she became dependent. She became independent after I got divorced. What can I tell you? Sammy, we have a question from Len Getz. Were you in Israel during the Six Day War? And if so, what was your involvement? I'm sorry, I did not hear it. Sorry, that might be my mic, and I apologize to all. I have some technical problems here. Were you in Israel during the Six Day War? And if so, what did you do? Yes, since I was in the uh, Israeli Air Force, and I came to the States only in 1968, I was there in basically uh, the first place that is bombed at the airport. If you survive the first half hour, 40 minutes, you're basically, okay, a simple employee, a worker in a uniform. So what I did is I uh, repaired the uh, planes. Uh, I, was, I worked on the most sophisticated plane at that particular time that the Israel had, and that was Mirage 3C. And uh, we were taught to work around the clock for 36 hours without sleeping. So even today, if I have a real project, and if something very important to me, I can go through it without sleeping. I don't need a lot of sleep. So it's something that uh, we were taught. And, uh, okay, we were so good at what we were doing and so fast that wave after wave went out. Uh, a lot of the people thought that the Israel received help planes from the United States, and that is not true. It was just us that we worked around the clock and they were very efficient. By the way, uh, when I was in the, the military, I was almost 22 years old. So do you know what they called me? They called old me Saba. man? No, they used to call me Saba, Grandpa. They were 17, 18 year old kids. So for them, 22 was wow. So old. <laughs> yes. Any other question, Alan? Yes. Can you hear me, Sammy? Sammy, can you hear me? Pardon me? Can you hear me? Yes. Mark Mayer Orlovsky asks a question. So how do you survive the Holocaust if you were so young? But I want to add to that, because I think you touched on that. How did your parents survive the Holocaust? OK. Uh, basically, because it was in a labor camp and not far away. And this is educated guess. I don't have facts because my parents did not talk about it. Uh, so basically, I'm assuming that they worked on the farm and whatever the Nazis asked them uh, to do. But working on the farm, they probably were also able to steal, okay, some food or whatever it is in the food things. And, uh, during those days, uh, people, there was only one thing in their mind, how to survive. They did everything possible that they could to survive. My father was an orphan of both of his parents. Uh, my grandfather died before he was born. Unable to take care of eight children, my grandmother decided to take the two youngest one and commit suicide. A stranger saved the children, but my grandmother did commit suicide. So my father grew up in an orphanage. And at age 13, they were thrown out on the street. So he became streetwise. It's a different streetwise than today, but that helped him during the war. And it helped him after the war when there was not enough food to provide for the full population. Just to give an example, okay, uh, you had to bribe somebody for a loaf of bread. But you had to make sure that you're talking to the right person because he could, okay, tell the government that you are trying to bribe and steal food from somebody else. Uh, at the same time, we could not afford to buy butter or cheese. There was not enough of it. It's expensive. So my mother used to bring bottles of milk, let them stay for a long time. Eventually, it turned into cheese and uh, butter. Uh, we, we lived in a house. There was no sink. We had to go to the well. 
can you imagine and it was quite far away okay how often we had to go to pick up two pails of uh, water bring in how many times we had to go to have four people take a bath we did not have toilets only outhouses in schools we did not have a gym everything was done in the courtyard the most popular game was soccer they did not have enough soccer balls okay to give to the kids so we used to make soccer balls from rags my uncle who lived in santa barbara sent a package and in the package there was a real soccer ball in a simple item made with the most popular kid in the school so life was totally different people do not understand hunger we uh, could not afford to buy fruits we used to go to farms we used to steal fruits but not when they were ripe because the owner would come and beat us up when they were still green and they have a green uh, they have a uh, sour taste so even today i would eat a granny smith apple but very seldom would i eat an every other type of an apple we had a forest so in the forest we used to go there to collect strawberry raspberry gooseberry and there was another farm and we used to go and steal okay watermelons i could watermelon was food okay so you had liquid sugar okay food and i was uh, in mexico for the third time in uh, january and that was the watermelon season my friend who brought me there he couldn't believe how much watermelon i gorged myself in and i said how can you eat so much i said it brings back memories i can still eat a full watermelon today i just love it it uh, brings back uh, memories Sammy, two more questions. I'm going to roll them into one. Um, one is, can you talk more about how you were homeless and how you got out of being homeless? And why can't you see your grandchildren? Very good question. Uh, when I became homeless, is like I told uh, before, is because uh, uh, people that I trusted stole money from me. Uh, I was in a shelter. And uh, interestingly enough, I started volunteering. And when you, you volunteer, you get a lot more than what you put in. If we have the time, I'll give you two examples, two organizations. I used to volunteer for 18 different organizations because each one gave me something that was missing in my life. In one of them is an organization that still exists. It's called Big Apple Greeter. For 17 years, I used to take visitors from other states and other countries and I showed them the city that I love. And I had two perks. Number one, I had to learn about the city. I was new at it. Number two, if I would have the money today, I can travel almost anywhere in the world. And there will be somebody that will host me and show me the city that they love. Okay. The other organization, uh, today I cannot do it. I started last year. Uh, this has nothing to do with the medical experiments. But um, uh, because of my age, I'm starting having difficulty walking long distances, going on an incline and climbing stairs. Uh, so I had to, to give it up. Uh, but the second organization is one that does not exist, HAI. Uh, my job was to pick up tickets and distribute to underprivileged people like me. But I had two perks. Number one, I could see the show. And number two, I could bring somebody with me. So I made a lot of friends this way. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the company went under, but I've seen broad wishes, more than you can think of, and you know how expensive they are, sports events, opera, ballet, everything that you can think of, concerts and everything else. I wish they would still be in existence, but I don't have it, but that, uh helped me culturally okay to regain something that i lost when i became homeless uh, and uh, like i said i went in for 18 different organizations each one gave me something totally different. but today uh i want to tell you uh something which is very important 
I think it was a fourth or a fifth grader. Ask me to summarize 72 years of life in two sentences. I gave an answer. It was fairly good because uh, I don't like to be scripted. I'm very authentic. I don't want to know what the questions are. But when I came home, I did not like it. And I said, how can I answer that question, okay, in a different way? And I said, let me think of the three most important things in my life. And number one, having my son. I knew the joy of parenting. It's the highest high that somebody can have, and it's something that nobody can teach anybody else. You have to experience it. Number two, I knew hate. Not from here. That's easy to overcome. I knew it from here. I know what hate can do to a human being. I couldn't believe that I could sink that low. I've been able to overcome it, and today I do not hate anybody. And you may be surprised. The most important thing that happened, besides my son, in overcoming hate, is being homeless. I would not be here where I am today if I would have not been homeless. I probably would have never volunteered. I possibly would have been in a different place, a better one, a worse one. But I would have never achieved what I achieved today. So I teach the young people never to regret what happened in their lives. Even the most difficult things that they go through make them stronger. They should learn from it. Okay? They should embrace it and move forward. It belongs to the past. Okay? The past belongs to the past. I have been able to do it. Uh, for me, in many ways, it came natural. A lot of people have to, okay, learn it, okay, and to develop that particular skill. Yes. Sammy, I have a question from Eugene Greenstein. I'm going to unmute his mic. Go ahead, Eugene. Uh, why, since you've been on campus, why do you think anti-Semitism is growing on campus, and what do you think we should do about it? The biggest problem, from my perspective, there is a lot of apathy. They do not have the feelings for Israel. Okay, they have not been properly educated at home. And if for no other reasons, because maybe the parents did not know. And what happens is, in that particular case, they feel they are not affected. Uh, there is a mob mentality, like I told you at NYU, it says there are so many of us that when they demonstrate, we just ignore them. And this is the wrong approach. When somebody says a falsehood, you have to stand up and call it. Take a look at our leaders. In the Congress, there were two resolutions anti-Semitism and hatred. They are two distinct things. They are not equal in any shape and form. But some people decided to put them together. And the Jewish leader were afraid to stand up and say, no, anti-Semitism is something totally different. It has to be separate. So they watered it down. And that's what I try to teach the young people, to be proud of who they are, to be proud to be a Jew, to be proud that we have a country of our own, that we can rely, and at the same time, under no circumstances, to be afraid and to speak up. When I was in Germany, I was interviewed by a newspaper, and a reporter asked me, what do I think? Because uh, they had the idea that Jews in Germany should not wear the kippah. And I said, it's the wrong approach. We have to wear the kippah, not to be afraid. Just as the Muslim can wear whatever they are wearing, why should we not be allowed to wear what we wear, what we believe in? And this is what it's coming, that we have to be proud of who we are. 
And that is what I am trying to teach the young people. Especially, you know, uh, in campus, because it's important for them to become active. They have too much bystanders. I'll give you an example that may surprise you. Uh, I hope that all of you have heard of the BBYO, Brave Brit Young Organizations. And I think three years ago, I was with uh, senior high school students from the Bay Area in the Machu Picchu. But they have a conventional, a international convention, and I was invited there. And there were 3,000 students from about 45 different countries. To my surprise, two of them, and they, when they were in Israel, they expressed their love for Israel. But two of them tabled J Street. So what is, I'm saying is we have to speak to the young people at a very young age. By the time they go to Israel, they are already indoctrinated. And it's very difficult to break it back. And we have to teach them the right things while they're still young. And this is uh, part of the problem that you're having with parents and uh, with uh, teachers and uh, the Jewish people are afraid, okay, to show who they are. Especially young people, even if their families did not go through, they don't have a personal story uh, from their families, they should learn a Holocaust survivor's story. And they should tell the story and to personalize it, what it means to them to tell that particular story. This should never be forgotten. And we have to be united to defeat the most dangerous virus, the virus of hate, bigotry, and anti-Semitism. Thank you all, and I'm extremely proud to be part of this DOA. I feel it is the most powerful, okay, voice in fighting for Israel. Tim, I want to thank you. And as most of the, as most of those who survived the atrocities of the Shoah have passed on, you, Sammy, and your inspiring story become an even more important resource. The truth about the impact caused by that Nazi-inflicted hell have more meaning when delivered by someone who survived their attempts to, to annihilate the Jewish people. We are, grateful for, we are grateful to you for being part of ZOA's Yom HaShoah program. We thank you for working so closely with our ZOA campus staff, and we wish you continued health and strength to carry on your life's work. May we always remember those who were murdered in the Shoah, and I pledge to you that the ZOA will always do our part to prevent future by fighting all forms of anti-Semitism with all of our strength and all of our resources, and we need all of you to do the same. Upcoming events in our virtual programming series tomorrow night at 7 p.m. I'll be interviewing I'll be interviewing Susan Tuckman, director of our Center for Law and Justice. The title of that program is Achievements in the Campus Fight Against Anti-Semitism and More. Please join us. And on Thursday uh, this week, April 23rd at 1 p.m., a uh, book club hosted by Liz Burney, director of our special projects, a Farrell Block book, and that's open to all. Understanding that these are very strange and difficult times, I hope you enjoy today's program and all of our ZOA programming. If you have the ability, please go to zoa.org, find the Donate Now button, and consider supporting our work. This concludes, our pro this concludes our program. Everyone, please stay safe and healthy. And until next time, Lehitra Oat.